I think about the quality of commercial airline travel in this country, which is a freaking disaster, right? And the reason it's a disaster is because over the past 20 years, everyone that could afford to have better plane travel and was in the front of the plane and had loud voices and had influence politically and made sure that if things didn't go well, they would bitch about it, are now basically flying private. Either themselves or they've got, you know, they've got options, they do, you know, they, they do the net share, the net jets. And so as a, as a consequence, the people that are left that are flying through their basic terminal in Newark and LaGuardia is everybody else. It's the aggrieved masses, right? We have by far the best educational system in the world if you can pay for a great private school. All the way, K through 12 and Harvard too. But do not tell me that when you have, take all those people out of the system, like I would be much better with saying no paternalism at all as long as we had the same access and the same system for everybody. Because then the elites would actually have some accountability for fixing the system that all the other poor bastards have to suffer with. But instead what we have is a whole bunch of wealthy people taking them out of the system and then saying, what are you complaining about? Not okay. We've got one system in this country and that really bothers me. So I think the response, when you have a group, the most powerful people in the country opting out and say, well, we'll just take care of ourselves. <laughs> you didn't build that. This was all me. My response is, we need a regulatory response to that. That was a very clever device of hitching <laughs> airline travel and education as to, because I think education and airline travel are quite different. They are different. Now, as anybody here knows, if you're watching me at, you know, on the live stream, um, I have some you're thoughts about airline travel. Off, are you? Yes, everybody leaves their shoes on. Um, I have flown in the front, I've flown in the back. Uh, at the time deregulation happened, only about 15% of American adults had been on an airplane, had taken a commercial flight. Really? Uh, you know, we're talking the 70s. After deregulation, now about 85% of American adults have flown a commercial flight, and I wish they wouldn't. Because <laughs> people fly, because again, it's, discretion, it's a discretionary thing now. Why do you fly? Because you can. Um, and then people complain about it. And they say, well, I can't, you know, I, the seats were so small. I had to take my shoes off um, and do yoga. Uh, and, you know, to me, the hell of airline travel is other people. Uh, and I can't opt out of the system. But I, I think what was, what's lost in this is this country, rich or poor, people fly like it's nothing, like at the drop of a hat. I was coming back from um, Ireland. And this was, of course, you know, anecdotes are not data, but um, I, I'm going to tell a story anyway. The guy behind me was horrendously hungover, and I knew this because he kept saying it to the guy sitting next to him. <laughs> and, um, and, he, and I'm listening to this conversation, he says, yeah, I was in Berlin, I was partying for a weekend. And they're talking, he says, what are you doing? Well, I'm a grad student. I'm a grad student in Boston. And he said, what were you doing in Berlin? He said, it was cheap. I decided to go see some friends and party for a weekend. Well, all of us here have been through graduate. The, the idea of taking a weekend off of graduate school and getting totally you know, loaded in Berlin for three days was completely unaffordable. But with cut rate airlines and deregulation, a graduate student can say, you know what, I'm going to go to Berlin, I'm going to go to an Airbnb or a, you know, a, a flop with a friend, I'm going to go out and party. Um, and that is in des things like destination weddings. Um, you know, going to Bali, things that, that think, that, uh, one of the things I raised in our, one of our internet discussions about, um, you know, going to Disney World used to be a once in a lifetime thing. Now it's a frequent flyer program. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to shift the discussion over to education, but when you're talking about the discretionary use of something that we once considered a luxury that people now consider a right, this is part of the problem I'm talking about, where people talk about air travel isn't pleasant enough and I feel like I'm on the verge of that old Louis C.K. bit about, and yet you flew <laughs> in a chair that went into the sky. Um, now, but with education, I think, yes, I think as with everything in a democracy, the ability of the wealthy and the educated to opt out at will is a problem. And that, that becomes a problem of fundamental freedom. 
uh, because I've been on both sides of that. I lived in a town for a while where I opted out of the public school system with my daughter, uh, but who now goes to a public school. Um, I think, you know, there's, a, there's an issue here about, I mean, I chose as a teenager to stay where I was and go to a public school. I, um, you know, my parents wanted to try to give me some other opportunity. Wouldn't have, would have been difficult to afford all of the problems that you know about. Um, and, and I think I was better for it. I mean, I'm glad I went to a public school. I think that's a really important, I think, you know, th these community organizations like schools, like the military, uh, like f fraternal organizations, um, these are all part, parts of how we all learn to live with each other. On the other hand, I'm uncomfortable telling people, um, you have to be the person who leavens this bad situation by being the good person. You, the person of good habits and diligence, have to, set, have to make sure that your children are there to leaven this otherwise, you know, to, to balance out the bad decisions of a lot of other parents who simply were not as conscientious as you were. Um, and I think, you know, the word that you just used is one you and I talked about as we spilled out onto 49th Street this morning, which is paternalism. Um, you know, the elites, I think this is a case where I would tell the, the, the masses, be careful what you wish for. The elites can solve a lot of these problems, but you might not like the way it's done because it does come down to some paternalistic. I mean, I like the smoking analogy because I think we, we found a really good balance between a careful hand of regulation, right, taxing cigarettes out the wazoo. Um, I'm all for sin taxes. I love those. Um, but also, a personal responsibility issue of, you know, I don't want you smoking in here. It's just a bad habit. Um, but I worry because populism, populist movements, and I understand, you're not, you're not asking them for solutions, but I feel like the problem we're wrestling around here is the solutions we keep circling back to are very forceful solutions. Um, and particularly given the country we live in now, I mean, the president gravitates toward I, will, I can fix things by executive power. I will reorganize things on a large scale. Um, you know, if you can do that for one group of people, you can do it for another group of people. And I think that kind of social warfare uh, is really an invitation to, uh, to chaos. And, and I, I, I want to find a better solution. To, I guess the, play, the one broad place we can agree is we do need to find a solution. Mm -hmm.